Welcome back to Voice Vember. Tonight, I'll be reading the next three pages of the speech Self-Made Men by Frederick Douglass. For those keeping track at home, these are pages 8, 9, and 10 from the Library of Congress version. Link, as always, is in the description. Though a man of this class need not claim to be a hero or to be worshipped as such, there is genuine heroism in his struggle and something of sublimity and glory in his triumph. Every instance of such success is an example and a help to humanity. It, better than any mere assertion, gives us assurance of the latent powers and resources of simple and unaided manhood. It dignifies labor, honors application, lessens pain and depression, dispels gloom from the brow of the destitute and weariness from the heart of him about to faint, and enables man to take hold of the roughest and flintiest hardships incident to the battle of life, with a lighter heart, with higher hopes, and a larger courage. But I come to the second part of my subject, which respects the theory of self-made men. Upon what meat doth this our Caesar feed? He hath grown so great. How happens it that the cottager is often found equal to the Lord, and that in the race of life the sons of the poor often get even with and surpass even the sons of the rich? How happens it from the field often come statesmen equal to those from the college? I am sorry to say that upon this interesting point I can promise nothing absolute nor anything which will be entirely satisfactory and conclusive. Burns says, I see how folks live that hay riches, but surely poor folks maun be witches the various conditions of men, and the different uses they make of their powers and opportunities in life, are full of puzzling contrasts and contradictions. Here, as elsewhere, it is easy to dogmatize, but not so easy to define, explain, and demonstrate. The natural laws for the government, well-being, and progress of mankind seem to be equal and are equal, but the subjects of these laws everywhere abound in inequalities, discords, and contrasts. We cannot have fruit without flowers, but we often have flowers without fruit. The promise of youth often breaks down in manhood, and real excellence often comes unheralded and from unexpected quarters. The scene presented from this view is as a thousand arrows shot from the same point and aimed at the same object. United in aim, they are divided in flight. Some fly too high, others too low. Some to the right, others to the left. Some fly too far, and others not far enough, and only a few hit the mark. Such is life. United in the quiver, they are divided in the air. Matched when dormant, they are unmatched in action. When we attempt to account for the greatness, we never get nearer to the truth than did the greatest of poets and philosophers when he classified the conditions of greatness. Some are born great, some achieve greatness, and some have greatness thrust upon them. We may take our choice of these three separate explanations and make which of them we please most prominent in our discussion. Much can certainly be said of superior, superior mental endowments, and I should, on some accounts, lean strongly to that theory, but for numerous examples which seem to, and do, contradict it, and but for the depressing tendency of such a theory must have upon humanity generally. This theory has truth in it, but it is not the whole truth. Men of very ordinary faculties have, nevertheless, made a very respectable way in the world, and have sometimes presented even brilliant examples of success. 
On the other hand, what is called genius is often found by the wayside, a miserable wreck, the more deplorable and shocking because from the height from which it has fallen and the loss and ruin involved in the fall. There is, perhaps, a compensation in disappointment and in the contradiction of means to ends and promise to performance. These imply a constant effort on the part of nature to hold the balance evenly between all her children and to bring success within the reach of the humblest as well as of the most exalted. From apparently the basest metals, we have the finest toned bells, and we are taught respect from simple manhood when we see how, from the various dregs of society, there come men who may well be regarded as the pride and as the watchtowers of the race. Steel is improved by laying on damp ground, and the rusty razor gets a keener edge after giving its dross to the dirt in which it has been allowed to lie, neglected and forgotten. In like manner, too, humanity, though it lay among the pots, is covered with the dust of neglect and poverty, may still retain the divine impulse and the element of improvement and progress. It is natural to revolt at squalor, but we may well relax our lip of scorn and contempt when we stand among the lowly and despised. For out of the rags of the meanest cradle there may come a great man, and this is a treasure richer than all the wealth of the Orient. I do not think much of the accident or good luck theory of self-made men. It is worth but little attention and has no practical value. An apple carelessly flung into a crowd may hit one person, or it may hit another, or it may hit nobody. The probabilities are precisely the same in this accident theory of self-made men. It divorces a man from his own achievements, contemplates him as a being of chance, and leaves him without will, motive, ambition, and aspiration. Yet, the accident theory is among the most popular theories of individual success. It has about it the air of mystery, which the multitude so well like, and withal, it does something to mar the complacency of the successful. <sighs> yep, that's a lot of metaphors. It's interesting to see him explicitly reject the accident theory of self-made men, and I look forward to seeing how he develops his alternative theory. But that's all for tonight, so until next time, consider whether to like, comment, and subscribe.